Hello, welcome back to the channel. Absolutely wrapped to see you all again. Now, what I'm going to be doing today and tonight is shooting with my Nikon Z6 here, H Alpha modified camera. Haven't had it out for a little while, uh, but I'm excited to get it out. Now I've got it fitted here at the moment with a 50 millimeter F 1.8 S lens. And I'm gonna be shooting with the 50 mil and also the 35 millimeter F 1.8 lens. The other exciting thing is I'm gonna be using the star tracker. So I'm gonna fit that up there. And here is my Iotron Sky Guider Pro. And I'm gonna be shooting with this combination. The Milky Way core is setting down in the Western sky looks an absolute treat. I'm gonna take you out there and show you in the field what we're gonna do, what we're gonna be shooting and how we're gonna go about doing that. Then I'm gonna bring you back to the studio. We're gonna do some editing. I haven't done a video for quite a while where I've taken you through from start in the field right through the editing to the end to find out what our final image looks like. So that's our plan today. Let's get going. Well, hello there again, and I'm out here under the beautiful night sky. The Milky Way core is stretching right across there in the western sky. Now here in the southern hemisphere at this time of year, it's about 11 o'clock at night, so it's not too bad. It comes right down low. It's really easy to get some good shots. I've got the tracker out here, and I've been shooting with a couple of different focal length lenses. At the moment, it's got the 50 mil lens shooting away there. Uh, but I was also using this 35mm Nikon f1.8 lens. So I'm using a 50mm f1.8 and the 35 f1.8 to do some star tracking. And I'm blending about 10 exposures. So I'm shooting at f2.8, two minute shutter speeds at ISO 800. And I'm gonna stack 10 of those together, get a fantastic, clean, noise-free background. Looking forward to it. So. Let's get into it. I'm gonna do a bit more and show you a bit around some of the other stuff I'm looking at here tonight. Now you can see here, I've got my Nikon Z6. Now this is the Astro modified Nikon Z6 that I use. So it gives that beautiful nebulosity in that hydrogen alpha region of the Milky Way up there. I've got it on my um, Ioptron Sky Guider Pro, which I've lined up here to the South Celestial Pole. Now, because I've got the eye polar scope fitted into this mount, it's a breeze, it's a piece of cake to actually line up. And it's, it's, people think it's complicated because you have to have a, some sort of computer. Well, I've got the most cheapest, smallest computer you could find. Uh, the primary school kids use these. They're a tiny little, little uh, tablet and it works a treat. I've got nothing else on the computer. It doesn't need anything else to run, just the software for the eye polar. It takes, literally five minutes to, to polar align here in the southern hemisphere it takes all the guesswork out of it for me and i'm using these um, lenses i could use far longer focal length lenses and i think still get really good results so i'm looking at these images now they are absolutely fantastic i mean i'm so excited by what i'm seeing on the back screen here it is just amazing love it now you'll notice i've got the tracker mounted very close to the car here and the reason for that is because when I first arrived, it was quite windy. Um, it's calmed down nicely now. But look, I reckon anything you can do when you're using these star trackers, to stop the wind um, blowing on the camera is a good thing. If it's really windy, often I'll take the lens hood off because that uh, is like a bit of a sail that grabs the wind. But to be honest, I prefer using lens hoods for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is if it's dewy, a bit of frost coming along, then that's the first point of protection. Now tonight's warmish, so it's not too bad. Uh, and especially when you've got wind, there's less likelihood of that. But on the other hand, there's a few cars going along the, the highway over here 
uh, and that lens hood is also beneficial to sort of um, help you know alleviate that that lens flare that might come because I don't I don't really want any of that so um, anyway that's my reasoning okay so over here in the paddock just behind where I'm positioned now there's a windmill now let me explain my methodology for using the star tracker now I'm going to shoot that windmill um, hopefully the wind dies down so it stops turning but nevertheless I'm going to give it a go so my methodology is this I'm taking all of my tracked shots here with a clear open sky and then what I'm going to do is go over there and shoot the windmill um, at, with my foreground shots do a bit of light painting or whatever I choose to do and then later on in post-production blend them together now the reason I'm not shooting the track shot in the exact same tripod position is because it's a lot easier to blend in the background sky if it doesn't have any interruptions in it so of course here the sky is beautiful you can see the Milky Way there behind me it is just absolutely awesome out here and I get so excited after being in lockdown for so long it is just so good so good to be back out here again oh, I'm just breathing it in I'll tell you what this is just so good anyway I'm going to get over there and see if I can shoot that windmill okay so here's that windmill I've just shot a number of images with both the 35 millimeter lens and the 50 mil lens it's, you can see it's spinning so that means the windmill part's going to be blurred which makes it a bit harder to post process I'll do my best see how we go but look at that Milky Way have a look at that wow this is just an absolutely brilliant location and I'm loving what I'm seeing here all right we're going to go back to the studio I'm going to run you through the editing process of how I'm going to put these together and we'll see how we go come on let's get into it so here we are at the beginning I'm going to be showing you the tracked sky images first up so we're going to be using three applications firstly Lightroom as you can see here secondly Sequator to do the stacking uh, and thirdly Photoshop to do the blending of the foregrounds so let's start here now you can see this first image I have here this was a test shot and you can see the settings here this is at f2.8 30 second shutter speed 35 millimeter focal length at ISO 5000 and I shot that just as a test to make sure I had my focus right also to make sure the star tracker was operating the way that it should be and as you can see it's a pretty good image just by itself looks great but the ones I'm going to use are these ones down here so I shot 10 well actually 11 because I can't count but anyway and this is what they look like these are uh, 120 seconds f2.8 35 mil at ISO 800 that's pretty much my go-to settings for when I'm tracking I'm going to brighten up those images a little bit also I'm going to just do a little bit of adjustment on the color with this uh, Astro modified camera it's it's quite tricky to say the least getting the color balance where you want it to be so I'll start there you can see it's quite a low temperature of 3000 but anyway with the Nikon Z6 I always adjust the color noise reduction here in Lightroom enable profile corrections it's built in anyway so it makes no difference nothing else I'm not doing any anything else on this image I don't think I need to I've got a good solid signal there looks nice and sharp everything looks to be uh, pretty well in focus so I'm quite happy with that so what I'm going to do now is select those images we're holding then shift on the keyboard sync make sure these are all checked so uh, you can see what's happening here all of these images are now synced together have exactly the same settings my next job is to export these as TIFF files go up to file export bring in the ask me where I want to go with that and I will say here create a new folder called 35 millimeter tracked sky and then I'm going to call these images 35 millimeter tracked sky and make sure that's set to TIFF and I want to make sure there's no watermark done that and I'll press export and you can see up here the um, export happening takes a little while to get going and that won't take us very long so our next job is to open up Sequator I'm on a Windows computer double click star images 
and go looking for where that folder is 35 millimeter track sky here it is open that up and I can see all those images there so I select them all and press open that's good now double click output and just type in there what I want to call this so I'm going to call it sequator and press save now simply all I have to do here is go into composition align stars click align stars and down here align only I don't need to worry about freezing a ground because there is no ground then I'm going to click on the start button I'm not doing anything with any of these you can see they're all off all of these settings here in sequator so I'm going to press start and now that will analyze all of these images align them and blend them together and reduce whatever noise there is in all of these images so the reason I'm doing 10 images rather than just one image is to increase the signal to noise ratio in other words less noise in the stacked images and you can see that's done it didn't take very long 24 seconds and you can see the final result and I'm happy with that so what I'm going to do is cross out of that that's already been saved so I just exit that and, and say yes so now we find ourselves back here in Lightroom you can see these are the sky images which I've done now I'm going to go and look at the foreground images and they begin here so what I did I took one image of the background and then I took three images of a light painted foreground and you can see them here so firstly I'll go to that background image I'm definitely going to brighten this up a bit because I'm going to do a sky replacement on this so I want to make sure it's quite easy to see I'm going to increase the contrast a bit that helps also I'm going to change the color temperature to bring it a little bit more in line with the other sky image color but we'll, that'll be close enough it doesn't have to be exact at this point in time okay I like that that looks pretty good uh, one thing I will do is uh, do my noise reduction here not that it matters greatly on that sky because the sky is going to be replaced but I'm going to do some noise reduction here just just to save any potential issues that may arise okay so now we're going to go to this first light painted image and I'm going to increase the noise reduction here as well I like the look of this see the windmill spinning which I'd probably prefer it not to be but there's not much I can do about that now I'm going to put some clarity into this because I want to make that windmill pop so there we go this by the way was shot at, at 10 second shutter speeds at f4 at ISO 1250 now the reason I went uh, for 10 seconds is because it, the windmill was spinning therefore it was wobbling a little bit and because I've got to blend these layers in I want to make sure it will blend properly so that's my reasoning and so I'm going to stick with that now I've just lowered the highlights a little bit so mainly because this grass here is not far off blowing out so I've just got to be a little bit mindful of that but I don't want to lose the windmill itself pretty happy with that let's go to the next one uh, this one's a lot duller deliberately but I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to use both of these so what I'm going to do therefore is increase the lighting on this one a little bit just so that I can choose later on if I like this one better or or that one better and uh, then I've got one more and this one was lit just a little bit from behind there you can see it there now um, I've, I've had to increase the the exposure a fair bit here but that's not a problem still looks good now one thing you'll notice when you have a windmill that's spinning you can actually see through the blades so you'll see stars where the blades are a lot of people look at these images and say ah oh, they're fake because I can see stars through the blades well that's what happens because there's gaps in there as it's spinning and the light of the star shows through okay so what I'm going to do is select those four images this is in Lightroom and I'm going to right click on one of them edit in open as layers in Photoshop what will happen now is that Photoshop will open those four layers as separate layers so let's just wait for that to happen and we'll continue so here we go you can see we've got our four layers there the layer at the top is the background layer so I'm going to drag that down to the bottom because I want the light painted layers to be on top of that now what I'm going to do just to give us an idea of what this is going to look like I'm going to highlight those three layers just by holding down shift on the keyboard and change the the blend mode from normal 
to lighten. And you can see what happens there. It gives me a rough idea of what this may well look like. As I said to you, I'm not going to use both of these foreground layers. I don't need to. But I'll have a look at them and just see which one I want to use. So first things first, I want to add some layer masks. I've got to get rid of all these stars. So, oh, and by the way, you're going to ask why I need to get rid of the stars because I've already got a sky. I did the sky replacement earlier and I don't want these stars there because what happens is exactly what you see here. You get all these blobs and I need to be rid of those. So I'm going to add a layer mask, hit this little square down the bottom, adds a layer mask to this image. And what I'm going to do then is get a, a brush and actually go to the brush. Make sure this is black here, 100% here. I'm going to go to a hard brush and a large brush, probably about, oh, that's well, a bit big. Let's just go a bit smaller than that. Probably about this big and 100% opacity and rub out the background. Remember, I've got a hard brush here. I'm getting pretty close to that windmill. The reason I'm using a hard brush and a big brush like this is just to make this whole job a lot quicker. Now you'll notice the thing I'm not doing here is using any selection tools. Now I've mentioned this many, many times in the past, but I'll mention it once more here. You don't need to use selection tools to do this. All I need to do is get rid of the white stars that you can see or the different colored stars. I don't need to worry about all the rest of the image. The black part of the image here will take care of itself because I'm using a light and blend mode. And whenever you use a light and blend mode, anything that's a dark color or tone will just disappear as soon as I apply the, the uh, other layers. Now, you notice I'm being tentative when I get close into the windmill because I can't exactly see where the background is. And one of the tricks I often do here is enable the bottom layer, but make it a little bit less opacity. So it, it sort of does show through a little bit. So let me just see. Yeah, that, see, you can now see behind. If I took that away, you can't see. Now I can actually see where the stars are and where the windmill finishes. Now, remember, I'm not trying to rub out the the stars that are on the background. I'm only trying to rub the stars out on this foreground layer. But I can actually see better. That's the only reason I just did that. I'm still using a hard brush, remember? Solid hard brush. So I don't need to worry about the stars except the ones that are going to show through. And that's why this looks like such a dog's breakfast because I'm not worried. I am honestly not worried about all these funny shapes. Now, I fully realize there are some of you who will be very OCD about this and you can't stand seeing this. I'm sorry. I apologize to you. But the reality is this is just how it works. There are some stars in, in amongst here and I need to be a bit more uh, strategic with getting those out. So let me just tiny little brush. And all I'm doing is spotting them out, as you can see here. There are occasions where you will have to go back and fix it up, but I'm, I'm pretty confident. Now, you might look at this and think that is an absolute dog's breakfast. Well, yeah. By the way, dog's breakfast is an Australian saying. It means it looks a mess and you'd be right. But you know what? When I enable this layer to its 100% opacity again, suddenly the dog's breakfast is gone. It looks fantastic. So. That's a quick way of getting rid of those stars. I didn't use any selection tools, and especially when you have a, a structure that's, that's fine like this windmill is, it's very difficult to use selection tools anyway. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is enable the next layer. What I'm gonna do is copy that layer mask by holding down Alt on the keyboard and dragging it down. And the next layer, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. Okay, so you can see what I've done here. Now, that last layer, by the way, because I reckon that was lit on the back there. I'm just gonna disable that layer mask for a minute. Yeah, see how the back of the windmill was lit from this side? So by um, copying that layer mask from the layer above, I've actually, without thinking about it, rubbed it out. So what I'm gonna do now is rub it back in, change that to white, make it a fraction bigger, and rub it back in. You can see what's happening there. I'm simply rubbing it back in. That was on that layer there. Now I have a feeling, uh, just let me just see a bigger view of this. I have a feeling that second layer is not going to be necessary, but I'll just, I'll just let it sit there for the time being. 
Uh, now definitely on that first layer I have to remove this because that's me that's my light painting now what I'm going to do there is make a soft brush and a little bit bigger than what it is there now and just rub it out whoops got to make sure it's on black here so you go back over here doesn't matter how many times you do this it's so easy to make the same mistakes every time you do it so I just rubbed that out that was me because I was too close to the edge of the frame there's there's a fair bit of spillage here and I'm gonna feather that so make it a little bit bigger or quite a bit bigger actually and just feather the edge of the frame you see what it does there by feathering it it blends it into the image a lot better than what it was before so that second one's the same but I, as I said I'm probably not going to use that we'll just wait and see now on this bottom layer uh, you can see the same thing over here I'm just going to feather it in on this side just to give it a little bit more there we go I think that looks better I don't even know if it needs to be there but what we've got now is one two three layers here which are the light painted foreground and one layer which is our single shot background now what I'm going to do is put these three layers by holding down shift select them drag them down to this little little suitcase down the bottom here which creates a group and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to make sure that I can hide them just for the time being reason being because I want to do a sky replacement on this my experience with sky replacements is that it works far better when you have a dark silhouetted foreground like this if I tried to do a sky replacement over the top of that it might not pick out this framework so well so what I'm going to do is just hide that as a group and what I'm going to do is select the bottom layer here and then go looking for my sky that I'm going to replace so the sky that I want to replace it with is the one that I created earlier on so let's find that okay so what I've done here is I've brought our sky stacked image that we created in Sequator back into Photoshop and the reason I've done that because I want to do just a little bit of work with this not very much but there's a few things I would like to do because it's already a pretty good image uh, and so what I'm going to do is a little bit of star reduction and then I'm going to do just a little bit of curve layer in here in Photoshop so first things first I'm going to go to select color range where it says sample colors I'm going to go to highlights I'm not going to change much there just a little bit selected and press OK I'm going to go back to select modify expand expand by two pixels and you can see now it's selecting more stars I'm going to go back to select modify feather one pixel and select OK all right so that's good now I'm going to, you can see what's selected there I'm going to go to filter other minimum and right here I'm going to have a look at this because if you go too far with these reduction filter you can end up with really bad blotchy images so what I'm going to do is look at this at about hundred percent and make sure that it looks pretty good that 0.6 at this point in time so I think I might just go with that make sure my preserve here is at roundness and then click OK and what that's doing is calculating what it needs to do which doesn't take long done now I press deselect and you can see now that the image has less stars it's, it's what's known as star reduction now the reason I like to do that is because it gives it more of a dreamy nebulous feel there's a lot of nebulas in through here and remember I was using an astro modified camera so you can see these nebulas all through here those really pinky purpley colors they really stand out with this camera now the other thing I want to do here is do a little bit of change to the overall color tone so what I'm going to do is add an adjustment layer curves adjustment layer as you can see but I'm going to go into the RGB value so I'm going to go to red firstly and I'm going to change the red as you can see there what that did it changed this image from being predominantly uh, have that red tone to less red and I'm going to go to green I'm going to increase the green a fraction which I just did by bumping that up there and then I'm going to go to blue here and I can do exactly the same thing with the blue channel add a bit more blue you can do this to your heart's content whatever you like the look of some people like it a little bit more blue some people like a little less blue 
Uh, if I go back to red, for example, and I click up here near the top, now I can I can increase the reds as well, as you can see there. So I think I'll I'll put it just about there. That should do the trick. Now you can see the difference that's made. It's gone from there to there. There's far less red in the image. Now you might look at it and say, I'd like a little bit more red. So easy to do. Let's just go back in here, back to our red channel, click on that spot where we were and bump it up just a tiny bit, which I just did. So now you can see still nowhere near as red as it was there. It's just got a little bit more and I like that. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is put another curves adjustment layer on this and do a standard S curve. So I'm going to drop it down there somewhere and boost it up a little bit there. And you see how that's making the image pop. Now, I don't want to be too radical with this because you can get really unrealistic looking images if you push it too hard. But I do like just the look of what I'm, I'm getting here. It's a good uh, adjustment to the brightness and the contrast in this image. So once again, you can see what it looks like without that. And that's with it. Now what that's done, I've noticed, is it's actually increased, I think, the red. So I'm going to go back into this adjustment I did a minute ago. Click on the, um, the red channel once, once again. Click there and just take a little bit of that red out again. Just about there. It's only subtle. It's only a little bit. And you can see now, see this is where we started. And this is where we finished. Oh, I think it looks pretty good. Don't worry, I can, I can make adjustments again later on, but I'm just, at this point in time, I, I really like that. So what I'm going to do is flatten that image. I'm going to go to Layer, Flatten. And what I want to do now is save that as a TIFF file, because I always save my skies that I'm going to use as a sky replacement as a TIFF file. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to cross out of Photoshop. This will take me uh, back to Lightroom. So when we get there, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Okay, so this is what it looks like in Lightroom. I'll just hit that full screen so you can see it a bit better. I like it. I like it a lot. Now, compare that to, for example, this image, which is where we started. That's just a single image. And this is where we finished. So it's just got less stars, but more contrast. I'm going to save that as a TIFF file. So I'm going to go to Export. 35mm track sky, TIFF, um, I'll, I'll make that um, West View, Z6A. I do this for my own benefit so I can remember which ones to use when I go to uh, reuse them later on. So I'm going to do that now, so just bear with me. Okay, so I've done that. Now back to our original image. What I'm going to do is replace the sky in this shot. So I'm going to unhighlight the group so we can just see the silhouette. I'm going to select that layer, go up to edit, right down to sky replacement. Now a lot of people worry about this tool, but I use it for this sky replacement because I'm actually just replacing the same sky that's there. It's just that it's a tracked version. You can see it's come down a little bit lower than the other one. That's because at different times that I'm shooting the skies and the foregrounds, uh, the, the sky is moving all the time. But it is exactly the same view taken at exactly the same night with the exact same camera and lens combination. And by the way, just looking at that, doesn't that look so beautiful? It is absolutely stunning. Wow. And I haven't done anything to that just yet. Now, if you look at the tools that are available here for the sky replacement here, you've got a few things here which you can play with. And I tend to want to do that generally. So I'm going to go in and have a bit of a look. The sky itself is fantastic, but around the windmill here, I just want to go in. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And what you'll notice is that I think we've probably lost a little bit of our windmill through here. So I can fix that by going into the edit tab here and actually increasing let me just rub this in. You can see what's happening there. It's rubbing a little bit more of the windmill back in. Now it's hard to get this right because as I said, you can actually see through this windmill. It's not, this is not an exact science. There's a whole lot of art here. 
and it's often the way it is when you're dealing with this type of subject. You can see there, there's a little bit of, there's too many stars showing through there. So what I'm going to do the same thing there. Just go in there with a small brush and just rub them back in. Now these are the fine adjustment tools you've got here before I click OK on that sky replacement because otherwise it's fantastic. Uh, and like I said, you can actually see through here. So it's not, it's not a problem because you can definitely see through this part of the windmill. The stars will be showing. So I'm not going to try and fill that in completely. That's not going to work, that's not going to work for me. Just going to try and get as best as I can. And let's go down here. Gee, that looks good. That looks great. Look at this grass. It looks just fantastic. There's a bit there that I think I could fix. Now you can move around the image. I'm zoomed in here. You can see everything that, that I can see. Looks good, looks good, looks good. Gee, wow. I might just click on that a little bit. There's a star right on the top of that post there. Um, and I can zoom in a little bit further if I want to. Just to get right in here and make sure that these stars, there's a few stars showing there. Now I'm being very, very picky here. So I can guarantee you that I wouldn't have to be this picky. It's still, I'd still get a good result. But I'll just show you how it works. See how I can actually rub out and make that a cleaner image? Now this is just a black part of the silhouette of the windmill. Now I want you to remember I've got light painted bits to go over the top of this. But when it comes to using a light and blend mode on your images, you need to have a good solid base layer which is dark for that light and blend mode image to sit over the top of. If you don't have that, then you can sometimes introduce a little bit of transparency into your image. And that's why people have tried using light and blend mode on daytime images and it doesn't work. That's simply because the, the, two, the foreground or sorry, the background layer is just not dark enough. It only works if the background layer is dark and that's why it works so well on these nightscape images because the background is dark. And so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just gently going over the framework of this windmill just to make it a bit blacker. Now, I, it may be overkill. I may not need to do it this much, but I am anyway, just to show you the level of detail that I will sometimes go to just to make sure I'm going to get a good image. Okay, so at this point, after I've done those adjustments, I look at the overall image and I love it and I press Okay, now before I do that, if I wanted to change a few things, brightness of the sky, temperature, color temperature, I'll do it later if I want to. I can scale the sky, make it a bit bigger or smaller, as long as it still fits the edges. And I can shift the edges, but because this is such a clean blend, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to press OK. And so you can see now it's created these extra layers, layer mask, etc. Now all I need to do is click on the group layer and there is my foreground that has come back to life. Now, if I want to do a little bit more fine detail here to have a good look at this image, uh, I can just zoom in a bit, but boy, gee, that looks good. Now, what I will do is disable that second layer, I think, because I don't think it needs it. You can see the difference it makes here on the windmill. It just gives that little bit of shade there on the top, and I think I prefer it without it, so I'm going to go with that. Oh boy, this is exciting. It looks so good. The other thing I'd suggest you do is just click on and off layers to see what they do because sometimes you will find that layers don't add something or they do. It just depends what you like. I mean, you might find, um, for example, this layer here, if I click on that, what it's doing is actually lighting up. Let me just get that arrow a bit smaller. I'm lighting up this area and some of these bits back here. But you might think, oh, do I need that? Well, it's lighting the front here. Now, by the way, you're probably wondering why it's a little bit out of shape. The reason for that is because when this was spinning, it was actually wobbling. And so what it's doing is it's only capturing the light that's being applied to it at that particular 
part of its spin. So it's a little bit thin here, not because it wasn't there, well, it may not have been, but it was wobbling. So when I applied the light to the back part of the windmill here, that was staying stationary enough to expose and not blur. But this is blurred because it's moving a long way, of course. But and that's what you get with windmills. You can't you can't be too fussy with them. So you can see the difference there. I think I might just leave. Well, actually, what I will do here, let me just make that a bigger image so you can see the overall picture. So with this particular layer, it's lighting up a bit of the ground here, which I want, but I don't want very much of it on the windmill here, but I probably do want that bit and that bit. So I'm going to go to the layer mask, get a fairly small brush in a soft brush and just gently rub out this bit because I don't think it's adding anything to that, but I'm going to leave it at the top there. This all comes down to what you think looks best with your particular image. And so at the moment, I've still got them all as separate layers. And so I can make adjustments to each layer depending on what I think is necessary. So there we have the front being lit there. Um, look, I, I like it. I think this, this grassy bit here is probably a little bit too hot. So what I'm going to do is hit the layer mask, get a very large brush, something like that and just I'm just going to feather it down just a tiny bit see how that's just taken away a bit of that that heat out of the grass there uh, as, as I said it's all up to your own interpretation of what you think looks good in your image I'm not going to sit here and tell you what I think you should do with your image because you have uh, your own imagination your own creativity attached to it but have a look at this image I think it looks pretty good, even as it is right there. So I think I might just leave it as it is right there. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flatten these images, flatten all this because this is a huge file size. I'm going to go to layer, flatten image, bang. And that is now a single layer. Now, a lot of you probably just had a heart attack when you saw me do that. I do this all the time. Don't worry. <laughs> it's something that I have. I don't have any heart attacks doing that anymore. You might think I've just, if I want to go back and change anything, I can't. Well, that's true, but I'm pretty happy with that so far. So I'm going to cross out of the program, ask if it wants to say, I'm going to say yes. This is going to take me back to Lightroom. I'm just going to do a few little more edits when we get back to Lightroom. All right, so here we are in Lightroom. I'll just click that full screen so you can see the image. Gee, that looks nice. That is very, very nice. But there's a couple of things I'm going to do here in Lightroom. One thing I'm going to show you, I don't always do it, but I will for this image, is to put some dehaze into this sky. So the dehaze has come up at 25%. And I'm just going to fill the sky pretty much with that tool. Okay. Uh, if I click on this little box here, it'll show you what I've applied that to. It has covered the windmill, but that's not an issue. And that's just giving it a bit more oomph into the sky. Now, if I wanted to, though, I can actually also increase or decrease the color balance. So I'm going to put a chuck a bit more orange into that and a touch more green, just a little bit. Because remember, this is an Astro modified camera. So there's a lot of magentas, a lot of reds um, by, by default. And sometimes you just got to get some of those out of there. Now, the other thing I'm going to do because I think it looks fantastic as it is, but what I'm going to do is put a, a radial filter onto this. And I want to show you what I'm going to do with that. Just something like that. I'm going to click on here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, and click exposure and drop the exposure a fair way. And you can see the center of the image is nice and bright, but where it's dark on these edges, that's where the darkness is going to be more exaggerated. So I'll just disable that red so you can see what's, what's going on here. You can see how it's much darker around the edges. Now, what I want to do here, this is more of an artistic choice, but I'm going to change the shape of this mask and create it into more of a barrel shape. Coming from, the idea of this is to make it look like the light is coming from here down onto the windmill. It's only a subtle change, let me tell you. So what I'm trying to make it look like is that the light is emanating from the 
galactic core of the Milky Way shining onto the windmill. And the windmill I've deliberately composed to be on the lower, uh, sorry, the left hand third of the image. The galactic core is up here on the top third of the image. And there's a beautiful, the Milky Way uh, Roafuki here is like a leading line that takes you into the windmill. Now, you might ask me, did I have that in mind when I shot this before I could see the windmill? Well, you know what? I did. Because I knew I was going to put the windmill on that side. Although, having said that, I didn't know which direction that windmill was going to be facing because it changes depending on what the wind is doing. But let's have a look at the full screen here. Oh, man. Have a look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that just gorgeous? I love it. I really, really do. Now, remember when I was out in the field, I shot with the 50 millimeter lens as well as the 35. So that's what the 35 millimeter focal length lens looks like. And this is one I've done previously with the 50 mil lens. Have a look at that. It's a completely different perspective. It looks different. Colors are different. The windmill's pretty similar, but it just has a completely different look about it. So that's the 50 millimeter and back here to the 35 millimeter. So I'd be really keen to get your opinion on which one you like best. And so just to recap, this is the sky taken with 10 tracked shots, f2.8, ISO 800, two minute exposures each. And then I've blended in the foreground, one background shot of the sky so I can do the sky replacement. And I only ended up using two of the foregrounds. They were shot at F4 ISO, I think it was 1600 or 1200 thereabouts. I sometimes I often shoot at ISO 500 or 800. And I think it doesn't really matter as long as you get the results that you're looking for. And then blended them together as you saw in Photoshop and that is the end result. Well, there you have it. I love these images. I think they've come up an absolute treat. And I hope you enjoyed going through the process of capturing from start to finish. I'll look forward to seeing you in our future videos. I've got a few things planned uh, and I'm looking forward to bringing some guest speakers to the channel so we can chat to a few other people. Looking forward to that. But in the meantime, you guys have a fantastic week. I'll see you next time.